Please be seated. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Colonel Art Athens, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership here at the Naval Academy. And I'd like to welcome you to the William C. Stutt Ethics Speaker Series. Mr. Stutt, for whom the lecture is named, is a 1949 graduate of the Academy, where he lettered on the varsity lacrosse team. He served in the Navy for five years and then began postgraduate work at the London School of Economics and earned a master's in business administration from the Harvard Business School. Mr. Stutt joined the investment firm of Goldman and Sachs and eventually became a limited partner in this prestigious firm. Mr. and Mrs. Stutt established this speaker series in 2005. The Stutts established this series because they understood the importance of thinking deeply about ethics, character, and leadership while one attends the academy and before one enters the fleet and the operating forces. Tonight is an opportunity for us to fulfill the Stutz vision as we listen, reflect, and take action. Our guest speaker tonight is Dr. George Lucas, the Naval Academy's class of 1984, distinguished chair in ethics, and a professor of ethics and public policy at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Dr. Lucas has had an illustrious academic career, and in addition to his current assignments, he has taught previously at Georgetown University, Emory University, Randolph-Macon College, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, and Santa Clara University. Dr. Lucas is the author of five books and more than 50 journal articles. Among those titles are New Warriors, New Weapons, The Ethics and Emerging Technologies, Anthropologists in Arms, The Ethics of Military Anthropology, and Perspectives on Humanitarian Military Intervention. Additionally, Dr. Lucas is the co-editor with Captain Rick Rubel of the textbook you use or have used in any 203, Ethics in the Military Profession, the Moral Foundation of Leadership, and the companion volume, Case Studies in Military Ethics. Not only are these texts used at the Naval Academy, but also at the Air Force Academy and ROTC units around the country. Dr. Lucas received his Bachelor of Science degree from the College of William and Mary, a Master's of Divinity from Northwestern University, and a PhD in philosophy also from Northwestern. On a personal note, I've known George Lucas for about a decade now. And I can tell you he's a man with a keen and penetrating intellect, unwavering integrity, and an inexhaustible commitment to helping military leaders think deeply about ethical issues and lead with a well-calibrated moral compass. I found that Dr. Lucas has the gift of taking complex issues and concepts and communicating them in a clear, understandable, and relevant manner. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Lucas with us this evening to address a timely and critical topic. And that topic is just war doctrine and cyber conflicts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucas. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, especially good evening to the United States Naval Academy class of 2014, as well as our generous donors and benefactors who are here this evening, especially from the class of 1964. Great to have you here. Um, esteemed and dedicated faculty colleagues, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, good evening, thanks for coming, and may the force be with you. Yeah, it's my solemn duty to tell you that you've been misled, uh, you've been had, uh, and this happens to me all the time. Um, when, uh, let's see, whenever, let's see, can I turn this mic off and use my lavalier? Okay. Um, this happens wherever I, uh, wherever I, wherever an audience has the misfortune of having listened to me speak, they come thinking they're going to hear that other guy. And obviously, Marge Bem, our senior staff assistant at the Stockdale Center, couldn't resist teasing you one last time on my behalf. So no, I'm not that guy. But it's even worse than that. Um, 
now that I teach also out at the Naval Postgraduate School, I report to a dean in the School of Business and Public Policy there whose name, and I'm not making this up, is Bill Gates. <laughs> So you can imagine when the new officers come in and the secretary comes out and says, George Lucas, you see Bill Gates, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, whoa, dude, you know, we're in California, now. <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, and even worse, down the hall, we have uh, our senior lecturer in um, program uh, management and acquisitions, Dave Matthews. So we think we have a hell of a famous department, but <laughs> I think we deceive ourselves. Um, well, look, I thank you for coming, but I know that you're not all here entirely voluntarily. <clears throat> and I do remember the fondness that midshipmen have for mandatory weeknight formations for any purpose whatsoever. Um, so I'm a little bit intimidated by that. And you know, when you interfere with people's freedom of choice, they can have a subtle way of exacting their revenge. I learned this when I had a similar honor a few years ago of giving the equivalent lecture out at the Air Force Academy, the Rife Lecture on Ethics in Colorado Springs. And um, I knew they, too, were a captive audience and that uh, I would have to try and do my best to make things interesting and entertaining. And I, I did what I could. And I thought it was OK. But then the cadet wing commander came up afterwards. You know, they, like, like here, they, they present you with a little token or a gift for coming to speak. And he had this beautiful carved mahogany falcon, the mascot of, of the Air Force Academy, to present to me. I still have it in my office. I'm very proud of it. But of course, he came up, uh, said, well, sir, uh, tonight you gave us a lecture. And so now we'd like to give you the bird. <laughs> so I don't know what you have in store for me tonight, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm ready for everything. <laughs> what I wanted to talk to you about tonight was a topic that half the class has already covered um, in the fall semester, and the, those who are enrolled in ethics in the spring will be taking this up in another week or two. Uh, the traditional or classical doctrine of just war. And this is a venerable tradition of philosophic and moral and even religious discourse in Western culture, and in, I hasten to add, in other cultures as well. There's a just war tradition in, uh, in Confucianism, uh, in Shinto, uh, in, uh, in Hinduism. Uh, there are discussions about the permissible kinds of behavior in wartime, when one should go to war, how one should fight wars, who are the appropriate targets, enemies in warfare, and who are to be exempt. Uh, so it's a long-standing conversation, and you'll be taking that up, or you've already done that, for those who had the course in the fall semester. My question tonight is, what has that got to do with this new domain or realm of conflict that we face now in the cyber domain? And specifically, the question I want to address with you is, can there be such a thing as an ethical or a just cyber war? So that's the question, that's the topic. And it may seem like a strange one, because why would we want to talk about ethics at all when we know that we are under relentless assault from enemies and adversaries, from criminal organizations and terrorists who are attacking us, uh, spying on us, and stealing us blind without regard for any of those topics. Why should we be the ones to worry about ethics? So I want to, in my presentation, try tonight to defend the notion that that just war tradition actually does help us think about these questions. It, I want to suggest that both we and our potential adversaries just might benefit considerably by giving some thought to what diplomats and international relations experts term governance. That is the principles that we find in morality and in the law that might encourage all concerned with or engaged in cyber conflict to reflect more cogently and coherently upon the strategic goals that might be served by such conflict. An ethical analysis of cyber conflict simply invites all parties to think clearly about what it is we're doing 
what we're willing and, just as importantly, what we might find ourselves unwilling to do and why. So that's the agenda. Let's talk first about the threats and vulnerabilities. That's an area probably all of you are familiar with, especially now that Dean Phillips and our cybersecurity team have instituted this uh, great new course uh, on, on cyber for everybody. You probably talked a bit about how things work and how, where the vulnerabilities arise and what we can do about them. Many of you may have read a book by Richard C. Clarke, the former national security advisor in the Bush administration on cyber warfare, or more recently, um, Joel Brenner's America the Vulnerable. Uh, he was senior counsel at the National Security Agency. And there's also a piece by journalist Mark Bowden, um, a book called The Worm on Configure, and Noah Schachtenberg, um, a reporter with Wired Magazine's Danger Room. All these people have tried, I think, very valiantly to bring these vulnerabilities to our attention, describe them in terms that laypersons can, can understand, and have done a service by raising public awareness of the nature and significance of cyber conflict. At the same time, they've induced in lieu of the kind of ignorance of this that, uh, that was characterized us until recently, now it's kind of high cyber anxiety. Everybody's hysterical about the risks uh, that we face in the cyber realm. And my own position on this is that threat inflation, which sometimes occurs an exaggeration, is of no more use to us in thinking about this question than would have been ignorance and avoidance. One glaring problem with how this issue is being discussed is something called equivocation. Equivocation is when you use words, terms, or phrases that have more than one meaning, and you don't just carefully distinguish what that meaning is. And frequently, it can be a divisive or a distinctive or diverse or misleading kind of meaning that you attach to terms. Here's an example of what I have in mind. This is from a piece that our Stockdale uh, resident fellows who are working on cyber uh, ethics and cyber conflict this year read together just this afternoon a piece by Commander Todd Huntley, who is a Navy JAG, and he's the JAG advisor to the commander of the Combined Forces Special Operations Command. This is his description of the problem of, that I'm calling equivocation in a recent article in the Naval Law Review. He writes, Distributed denial of service attacks, in scare quotes, extraction or modification of information, website vandalism, as well as insertion of malicious code designed to damage or destroy data and systems, all of these are referred to as cyber attack or even cyber warfare, regardless of whether these activities result in death, destruction of property, or merely the loss of information. Intrusions and other activity conducted by disgruntled employees, teenage hackers, and criminals are typically not distinguished from those by terrorists or foreign intelligence and military personnel. So he complains, as I complain, about the overbroad use of cyber attack and cyber warfare. A good example of this can be found in Clark's book. For those of you who've read that book, you remember early on in it, he presents a chilling scenario of what a cyber, true cyber war would look like when the president is notified that all over the country things have gone suddenly totally haywire. Poisonous gases are escaping from, from uh, chemical factories near crowded cities and, and, and heading that way. Trains are derailing, planes are falling from the sky. Um, and uh, you know, power plants are down and uh, uh, the information superhighway is shut down and so forth. Uh, dams are bursting and people are being flooded and inundated, farmland is being destroyed and so forth. Um, so you're, you hear this and you go away with the impression that all of this could be in principle done by your neighbor's teenage son up in his upstairs bedroom or by a small Al-Qaeda terrorist cell working out of a tiny apartment in Hamburg. In the Q&A, we can talk about the feasibility of actors like that doing something like what I've just described on a national scale, uh, coordinated across the country. 
But that's the impression that we're left with, that, that that's the level of our vulnerability. Um, most of the actual discussion, however, of cyber war and attacks has been oriented towards criminal activity, vandalism, theft, and acts of espionage, which are very serious and very harmful. There is, however, a heated debate amongst people who are working in this field about whether well-publicized cyber events, for example, in Estonia, Georgia, and Iran, that we will turn to momentarily, even constituted cyber attacks at all, since, as those critics complain, no lives were lost or permanent damage or harm done. My point is that all of these discussions frame for us difficult and as yet unanswered questions, such as what constitutes the use of force, a legal term in international law, what constitutes the use of force in the cyber realm? When, if ever, does such use of force rise to the level of an armed attack, also an important threshold in international law? of the sort envisioned in the United Nations Charter, for example, constituting a legitimate cause for war and self-defense. More generally, what is the nature of the harm or damage done through such attacks when it's not explicitly kinetic or physical harm? When does the harm on whatever account, done through relentless intrusion and invasion and theft of vital information, potential sabotage of vital infrastructure, that's what's been going on in our behind our back, so to speak, in our country even now. When does all that rise to the level that justifies retaliation, either in kind with a similar cyber attack against the perpetrators, or by means of a kinetic repri reprisal? And finally, when formulating our strategies for cybersecurity and defense, what is the relation on one hand between privacy and any right an individual citizen may reasonably claim to such privacy and to anonymity on the other. Are these really equivalent? If you've followed the debates uh, of internet sort of um, hacktivists and activists, including the group Anonymous, you may know that there are a great many users of the internet. They're jokingly referred to as those who started it, the scientists and the aging hippies like me, you know, who, who think that they can do anything they want, and no one should know who they are that they should have the cloak of anonymity. Those of you in any 203 remember the story from Plato in the Ring of Gyges about what happens to a shepherd when he's given the cloak of anonymity. He realizes he's no longer accountable for anything he does, and so he's willing to do just about anything. Um, is that what we mean by privacy? I don't think so. But again, we can talk about that afterwards. These are all questions on which we're still largely unclear in part because the domain of cyberspace seems to be so novel and unique. And we've got a history of sort of backing into it until just a few years ago that was very casual and largely unreflective. These problems and questions pertaining to cyber warfare have arisen then not through judicious pursuit of carefully formulated strategic policies, but largely through the unreflective evolution of behaviors and through the gradual emergence of new possibilities and unanticipated prospects over the course of time, leaving us to wonder, as you will now be invited to wonder in the course, about the impact of these new developments on the military profession itself, as well as their ramifications for ethics and international law. Well, these questions have begun to be addressed, at least, in the emerging cybersecurity strategy of the United States, of which there are currently two versions, one from the Department of Defense and one with the seal of the White House that was drafted largely by the Department of State. The rhetoric of both is quite distinct and different, but both managed in their own way, as the American humorist James Thurber used to remark, to amuse with their pretensions. The latter, the State Department document, um, is visionary, it's aspirational, it acknowledges the cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities, but it focuses largely on the prospects for global peace and international prosperity that an open, transparent, universally accessible global internet promises to yield. By contrast, our document, the DOD document, released finally just last summer, displays what I'd call the protective paternalism that one might expect from responsible military intelligence and security forces. 
That is, the document is chock full of threat assessment, cognizant of the bewildering array of vulnerabilities, and fairly bristling with proposals for defensive and counteroffensive measures in response, the cyber equivalent of barbed wire, steel, and landmines. One DOD official summed it up last May for the New York Times as the document was being prepared for publication and release. So basically, it boils down to this. If you shut down our power grid, we maybe will just put a missile down one of your smokestacks. Well, that's tough talk of deterrence, and that might give pause to reasonable self-interested adversaries. I myself am less certain that criminals and terrorists are going to be dissuaded by such talk. In any case, I hope you'll see that immediately a question presents itself. First, whose smokestacks, given the difficult problem in cyber, what's known as the problem of attribution? And perhaps just as important, how many missiles down how many smokestacks? What cyber damage or harm would we need to sustain in order to provoke that kind of response? And the trick is, we'd need to have an answer on one hand, so that we could develop and formulate and put into place a coherent policy of defense and retaliation and response. But as Martin Lebicki at the RAND Corporation points out, at the same time, we wouldn't really want to be completely clear about what that policy was or advertise it too effectively, since adversaries invariably try to do what midshipmen do with conduct rules, uh, which is test the limits and game the system and sort of see how far they can, can stretch things. So in order for the desired deterrent effect to occur, it would be better, Lubicki says, to keep them guessing and worrying. We need to remain deliberately vague about where those limits are, just the sort of double deep deception we used to practice against the Soviets during the Cold War. Finally, are smokestacks and power grids the proper sorts of targets? Perhaps responding in kind to an enemy's cyber attack on vital infrastructure would be appropriate, but would we want to make such attacks on civilian infrastructure part of our own offensive strategy? Would we be willing, for example, to use a sophisticated cyber weapon to take out, say, the Three Gorges Dam and subject millions of ordinary farmers and citizens to drowning, starvation, and immiseration merely to counter an armed confrontation or military standoff over the Straits of Taiwan? Or worse, in response to conflicting claims of regional states over mineral rights in the South China Sea, in which we as a nation have no claim or direct interest? Well, those are some of the puzzles and threats and vulnerabilities with cyber conflict. How are we supposed to go about formulating answers and developing policy? The view I wanted to defend tonight for you in this class that you're taking is that when we come to questions like this, we're driven back to foundational resources, to traditions that attempt to guide us in balancing important guiding principles and values against the lives and welfare of large numbers of people who might be affected by such events. That's never an easy balancing act. But we do have resources, and we do have experience in applying them to questions like these. We find these resources in the cardinal principles of international law that in turn reflect centuries of philosophical evaluation of such moral dilemmas known as the just war tradition. That tradition and the body of international law derived from it counsels us in two respects. They advise us first on when we are entitled to use force or engage in an armed attack against adversaries who have harmed or threatened to harm us. And secondly, how we are to go about doing so. And those who have studied this in the fall semester, uh, and those who you're about to in the next few class sessions, will know that those two sets of questions and responses traditionally go under their Latin headings, which medieval lawyers originally coined in idiomatic Latin as jus ad bellum and jus in bello, respectively, the questions about when to fight and the questions about how to fight. In answer to the first set of questions, the so-called use ad bellum, the use of force, the tradition tells us, is justified only reluctantly and in behalf of a grave and serious matter of state, and only after all reasonable attempts by duly constituted or legitimate authorities to resolve the conflict have failed. 
These three specific observations are known, remember this for the quiz, those of you who are in class this time, they're known as just cause, legitimate authority, and last resort, respectively. There are also some other concerns that you have looked at or will look at that come into play in reaching a decision about whether to, to engage in armed attack, such as what are the proper goals and intentions to pursue, and whether the harm that, will be that has been done to us is sufficiently grave to justify war for in its resolution. That one's called proportionality. And there are others. When the resort to force by answering or confronting and wrestling with these questions is found necessary, according to those criteria, the conventional response to the second set of questions comes into play, the so-called use in bellow. They declare that force must be employed only to the degree required to achieve legitimate military objectives, and that it should be directed only against representatives of the military forces of the adversary, and never deliberately against third parties or non-combatants. These guiding principles of just war doctrine are likewise the cardinal principles of the international law of armed conflict, known broadly by their philosophical names, I'm, I'm proud to report, as proportionality, in this case, proportionality of means, sometimes called the economy of force, only as much force as is needed to achieve the second one, military necessity. Uh, there has to be some useful purpose um, towards which the force is deployed. And the third one is the principle of non-combatant immunity or discrimination. Sometimes international lawyers will call that the principle of distinction. So these things go by slightly different names, but they're basically the same set of, in a way, kind of common sense considerations that you'd ask yourself as you're either deciding to go to war or how to conduct the war you're in. In international humanitarian law, the principle of proportionality of means takes an additional form in specific legislative prohibitions against weapons or uses of force that inflict cruel and unusual suffering. Now here's the important feature of these principles. These cardinal principles or strictures of the law of armed conflict reflect what I would call a grudging moral consensus achieved over centuries of state practice between rivals, enemies, and adversaries to attempt to limit the collateral damage of war. We don't deliberately target civilians or civilian infrastructure, for example. We take reasonable care to limit the degree of force deployed in pursuit of a legitimate military objective in order to avoid disproportionate collateral damage. In my own work on these topics, it's been my privilege, in a way, to suggest that these aren't things made up by guys wearing suits and fancy ties in Geneva and imposed on you from without. I've tried to show how these legal constraints that they do discuss and enshrine in black letter law emerge from the proper practice of the profession of arms. They constitute, finally, its most sacred and fundamental moral values and professional principles and commitments. They're thus not imposed externally. These are not handcuffs that we put on military personnel to make it harder for them to do their jobs and place them at a competitive disadvantage against ruthless and unprincipled adversaries. Rather, such norms and constraints on permissible action arise out of the reflection by military personnel themselves, by the men and women that you see here who have served. Um, they reflect their professional identity, and they reflect the underlying purpose of the military profession itself as a vital form of public service. So that's why your textbook is subtitled as it is, The Moral Foundations of the Military Profession. So now the question we face to return to the present is how and perhaps even whether those traditions that you have or will study, those long-standing principles and traditions, can they now offer us any useful guidance in the cyber realm or rightly constrain our efforts to respond to and resolve cyber conflict? We'll consider, to begin, that by far the greatest areas of vulnerability are not hardened, encrypted, and securely firewalled military and security targets, although distressingly these are still surprisingly and disturbingly vulnerable. Rather, as in the nuclear conflict during the Cold War area, the areas of greatest vulnerability are, yep, civilian populations, what the law calls civilian objects, that means power stations, TV stations, bridges, roads,